This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. The second speaker of this, uh, of this afternoon session Sorry. is uh, Mary Pardo, who is Associate Professor for Art History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Professor Pardo research has concentrated on art criticism and theory of the Italian Renaissance, and throughout her career she has been continuously intrigued by word and image relationships, a theme that has influenced many of her academic projects including our current study of relations, of relations <coughs> between images of love and art in religious worship during the Renaissance. She has written on the comparison between poetry and painting, especially in the context of the Venetian Renaissance, and of course she has also written and published on Leonardo, and today she will speak on quote, Leonardo's Nova Invenzione di Speculazione. Thank you very much. Um, let me know if you can... Sometimes I think I can't hear with my own microphone, so. Does that mean forward? Yes. By contrast with Michelangelo, whose burlesque poem ends with a proud and scornful declaration, I am not the painter, but leaves us thinking the very opposite. I am not joking when I say I am not a Leonardo specialist, and in the presence of so many brilliant colleagues, in this poem of profoundest scholarship, it will be only more obvious as I proceed than I'm not. My aim today is to explore the margins of the Leonardo topic that is familiar to everyone here. As it happens, Michelangelo's comic sketch of the artist at work, both in itself as an example of the expanded possibilities of drawing in the years around 1500, and in relation to the great work on which it is a gloss, is a very suitable entry point for my presentation. Michelangelo's sketch undercuts the artist's own colossal aspirations by proposing a ratio. As the marginal sketch showing deformed artist and visible work is to the great fresco centered above the high altar of the Pope's chapel, so the sublime accomplishment of the painted separation of light and darkness is to the real creation of a universe from nothingness. And yet, the artist who drew the sketch did not just paint the fresco. He invented his eloquent figures with the aid of swift pen and ink sketches just a couple of degrees removed from that of his comic self-image. And the creator figure on the Sistine ceiling likewise might have objected, I am not a painter, yet the Genesis narrative had him making, to begin with, a visible world representable with the painter's basic instruments of light and shade. Since the Dugento, there had been much in the Florentine workshop tradition that underscored the relationship between divine creation and human fabrication. But it was in Leonardo's time, and largely through Leonardo's example, that this relationship became codified in what, what we might recognize as modern terms, even for those who did not embrace Leonardo's scientific and philosophical interests. And as the splendid current exhibition demonstrates, this was not strictly a Florentine affair, since Leonardo undertook his first systematic writings on artistic and scientific topics during his millennium's career. As I turn to Leonardo's contribution, and especially to the manuscript evidence that can be firmly attached to Leonardo's stay in Milan, I wish to express my indebtedness to Martin Kemp, whose research on Leonardo's neural anatomy has been crucial to my understanding of Leonardo's unusual bridging of practice and theory, and to Claire Farrago, whose exemplary study of Leonardo's writings draws on a deep knowledge of early modern critical discourses. She's also very generous. So. An important index of Leonardo's seriousness about the deeper significance of the artistic process is that he put considerable effort into <coughs> his investigations of living organisms and the principles of the natural world with his understanding of the scope and the instruments of artistic practice. As you know, E. H. Gombrich showed more than half a century ago that Leonardo wrote in an especially suggestive way about the relationship between compositional drawing and a type of visualization exercise that consisted in finding figures in motion 
by looking at indeterminate surfaces, spotted walls, banged stones, clouds. And I'll quote, O oh, you who compose historia, do not distinguish with finished contours the members of those historia, for you will experience what happens to many painters who wish for every least charcoal stroke to be valid. But many are the times when the living creature represented, lo animale figurato, does not have, I have a reason for emphasizing the animal part, does, does not have a movement of the limbs appropriate to its mental movements, but because he will have made a fine and pleasing set of members, well finished, it will seem to him, we'll switch to the artist now, a harmful thing to transform those members higher or lower, backwards rather than forwards. Now, have you ever considered, have you, excuse me, never considered how the poets composing their verses do not trouble themselves to write beautifully and do not mind crossing out some of those verses, rewriting them better? Therefore, painter, compose roughly, componi grossamente, the numbers of your figures, for you will understand that if such an uncultivated composition, componimento inculto, is appropriate for its invention, so much the more will it satisfy when it is adorned with the perfection appropriate to its parts. I have seen in clouds and walls blocks, macchie, that have roused me to fine inventions of various things, which blocks, though they were wholly lacking in the perfection of any one member, did not lack in perfection, excuse me, did not lack perfection in their movements or other actions. Quote. Gombrich's key examples of Leonardo's block-inspired or block-like drawings were the British Museum's sheet of sketches for the Burlington House cartoon on the left, and the pen and ink a pen and ink sketches in Venice for the Battle of Anguiara Commission. The one is a tender holy kinship scene and the other is a scene of martial violence. Both provide breathtaking evidence of the ferocious energy with which Leonardo tackled their compositional challenges. Reading the fluid or undefinable patterns in clouds and spotted walls, in Gombert's view, helped Leonardo animate his figures by freeing him to revise at will the placement of their limbs, crossing out and redrawing them like a poet rewriting lines of verse under inspiration from his subject. This reference to the self-critical process of poetic composition shows Leonardo likewise revising Alberti's rhetorical schemas for composition, in which no mention is made of deliberate recording visual disorder, but the painter is rather encouraged <coughs> to avoid error altogether by using geometric construction and, if necessary, by resorting to tracing devices. The Leonardo's provision had as much to do with his ongoing investigation of the relationship between sensation and understanding as with the role of current literary models in shaping painters' procedures. By this I mean that Leonardo began in the early 1490s to correlate the different modes of graphic preparation, finished drawing from two and three-dimensional models, sketching from natural or live models, compositional sketch, with the various functions of the internal senses or faculties of the mind. He proposed certain kinds of drawing as geared to the faculties of judgment, common sense in certain formulations, memory, and others to the visualizing and recombinatory faculties, fantasy or imagination in its passive and active forms. The compositional sketch, purported, excuse me, purposed with animating the entire historia was Leonardo's mode of drawing geared to the fantasy or imagination. I do not mean that it merely engaged the imagination, it was meant to make up for its imperfections, as sketching from everyday scenes was to make up for some of the defects of memory, and drawing from live or artificial models was to make up for the defects of judgment. <coughs> Unlike the various post-sensory mental faculties, which were housed in the small, dark dome of the skull, drawing was practiced in real space, in the real light of day. Leonardo well knew that the artist depended on his own mental faculties for the creation of true <coughs> and beautiful images, but he was also microcosmically certain that mental faculties could be augmented by contemplating, or rather incorporating, the mind of nature. 
So when contemplating external objects characterized by turbulence or indistinctness, maculated surfaces, for example, it was as if one contemplated fantasy on the outside. It seems no accident that Leonardo determined to explicitly correlate the key elements of studio practice and the mental function at a time when he was organizing a workshop and juggling different sorts of commissions, while acquiring a growing expertise in many fields that were not limited to the practicalities of the workshop. His pedagogy was no doubt practically motivated, yet it was also fueled by his need to grasp the mechanisms of understanding. The drawings on which Gombert built his argument belong in the post-Milanese phase of Leonardo's career, and he focused on a version of the visualization exercise instructions from the compilation of Leonardo materials known as the Codex Rubinus, which you are all very familiar, I'm sure, which was assembled from the original manuscripts after the artist's death. This passage, which was the one that I read, has been dated as early as the 1490s, but exhibits a maturity more likely from the period 1500-1505. I would like for us to go over a version of the prescription appearing in manuscript A at the Institute of France, the closest thing to surviving original draft for Leonardo's treatise on painting, dated on the last folio to July of 1492. The passage, which differs strikingly from the more literary and also far more explicit and detailed version found only in the Codex Rubinus, appears about two-thirds of the way into the third folio section that deals almost exclusively with the art of painting. On folio 101 recto, Leonardo had given a lengthy, spectacular instruction on how to depict a storm. This is something Alessandro Nova should probably explain to you. On folio 102 verso, it is as if he realized that here might be an easier way to accomplish this. A method for enhancing and rousing the ingenium to various inventions. I will not refrain from placing among these precepts a new invention for speculation, which, though it may seem small and laughable, nonetheless is of great utility in rousing the ingenium to various inventions. And this is, if you will examine certain walls besmirched with a variety of stains, lacking, or examine variegated conglomerate stones, if you have to invent some site, you will see there the semblances of diverse landscapes adorned with mountains, rivers, rocks, dawns in the Marinoni transcription that I think probably out all there is <coughs> trees, great plains, valleys, and hills of different types. You may also see diverse battles and prompt actions by figures, strange expressions on faces and costumes and infinite things, which you will be able to reduce to an integral and proper form. And in such walls and conglomerate stones, the same happens as with the sound of bells. In his reign, you will find every name and word you can imagine. In this passage, Leonardo does not provide a correlation between the discovery or invention of dynamic scenes and the actual procedures for raising or lowering, advancing or recessing limbs, that is, the poetic method of autocorrection when working with figures that is proposed in the Codex Rubinus. Instead, he emphasizes, emphasizes excuse me, that this is a procedure to awaken the powers of the ingenium, which I here take to mean the fantasy or imagination rather than talent, which would be the usual translation. I believe Leonardo is considering ingenio in its etymological sense as that which engenders or is engendered, and thus would be considered the source of invention. In the painter's case, it is also a central faculty for processing visual sensations. Leonardo's invenzione di speculazione is itself an invention, as well as an aid to invention. And it reprises the precept that appears virtually at the beginning of manuscript A's Renato <coughs> sequence, as Claire Farrell has termed it. The ingenio of the painter wants to be in the similitude of the mirror, which is always transmuted into the color of that thing it has for an object. This first surviving instance of Leonardo's fantasy augmentation device, therefore, is geared to impregnating the painter's ingenio with what is present to it. In this case, a spotted surface, itself a kind of virtual picture, or multicolored stones, ingredients 
for a virtual palette. These are also virtual worlds, and we should recall that the word makya, meaning spot or stain, already in Krichanko also meant scrub, as in wild, uncultivated terrain, the ancestor to our own maki. In other words, this passage contains the germ of the Komponenko in Kultu, but is yet unexplored for its critical potentiality. Elsewhere in this manuscript, Leonardo keeps returning to the question of depicting shadow, which comes to outweigh his discussion of perspective. Shadow is associated with a constant displacement of contours away from visibility. Leonardo refers several times to their serpentizing. They cannot be still. Rather, in living things, they wriggle away from us. When he takes up the idea of the component in culto and the fuller passage in the Codex Urbinus, he will state explicitly that he is referring to the perfection of imperfect things. It is found in coarse, unfinished forms. The indeterminacy of shadow on living or moving contours turns out to be one of the reasons for the component in culto's effectiveness in bringing motion into the picture. Finally, I want to consider for a moment Leonardo's demurral in this passage. His device is most useful, though it may seem a small thing and laughable. I believe this also applies to the kind of artifice that is required to extract the invention from the Muro in Bracato, the wild scrawl of Ben Gary Rawlings, the comic little sketch on the margin of Michelangelo's poem. The revolutionary aspect of Leonardo's, the revolutionary aspects of Leonardo's art are as much bound up with smallness, playfulness, invisibility as with the more spectacular demonstrations of his skill. That said, I would like to turn to a corpus of works that were generated in Florence but accompanied Leonardo in all of his peregrinations. And, and <laughs> do it advisedly, um, I think of them as in some ways the funny side of Leonardo, I guess. Gombert claimed that Leonardo's drawings became his own port portable stained walls because he seemed to generate new ideas, ideas from older designs. His Milanese pupils and associates evidently profited from this, but perhaps not as much as they may have if Leonardo had arrived in Milan with a fully articulated art theory, which I don't think he had. Claire Farrago has suggested to me that without benefit of the componimento in culto amplification, Leonardo's Milanese pupils could not fully grasp his new invention for speculation or fully profit from his compositional <coughs> strategies, and I believe she's right. As the current exhibition demonstrates, Leonardo brought to Milan from Florence a trove of studio materials, including drawings and panel paintings, in which he had first worked out his novel uses of the compositional sketch, while still an apprentice or associate of Verrocchio of Florence in the late 1470s, or very beginning of 1480. For the remainder of this paper, I will focus on this earlier material and seek to link it to Leonardo's earliest data the formulation of the visualization exercises, uh, which in fact took place in the early 1400s in Milan. So I'm, I'm really saying, in effect, that um, I think Leonardo had kind of worked out the, the practical possibilities of uh, the component of culto in some measure uh, before he went to Milan, obviously, but it took a while for him to sort of theorize this. These drawings enduring value to Leonardo's later work has long been known, but their genuinely puzzling subject matter has made it hard to interrogate them in connection with Leonardo's maturation as an artist scientist, and I'm not going to do a terrifically good job of that, but I'll make a few stabs at it. Instead, they have seemed like direct evidence of his more mundane concerns as an up-and-coming artist in a competitive market, which they also are. The first thoughts and compositional sketches for the Madonna of the Cat form a cluster of especially lively exercises for the young Leonardo. Several sheets have survived which attest to his fascination with the motif of a toddler alternately embracing and caressing a cat. The child's figure is a less elaborate variant on Baracchio's, um, on Baracchio's masterful drawings of toddlers in pen and ink over an underdrawing uh, in a drawing medium. At the same time, Leonardo, who also draws over an underlying sketch, clearly exploits the dynamism of the pen stroke and allows himself untidy, open-ended figuration uh, that goes rather beyond what Baracchio um, has attempted. 
Patricia Rubin, whose noted attention to Leonardo's sketches became his indulging and remarkable gift for direct observation, and his seeking to extract from the encounter a balanced formula for physical interaction. <coughs> Uh, the verse of the sheet on the right, which includes um, both uh, an image of the cat as a knot of pink heel and strokes that stand for flailing limbs. I guess I really like the that part of drawing up there. Um, and another, as a miniature person sitting up like a child, with the awkward little sitting up cat at the bottom. Um, <laughs> uh, excuse me, I just didn't want to again. Uh, a miniature person sitting up like a child shows the breakdown of the design experiment. Uh, but another of these airy sheets includes, uh, and I did not bring that one, uh, the young mother in a fainter tracing indicates the direction in which Leonardo will, in fact, develop the motif. <coughs> um, Veronica's Pudo with the dolphin, with its sophisticated intertwining of serpentine dolphin and pivoting winged child, is evidently the other and more crucial model for Leonardo's exploration and may also provide a thematic key for investigating the, the pairing of child and cat, which, by the way, nobody has really explained so it's like poorly. Some, somehow it seems to be an urban myth that um, a cat was present at the nativity. And uh, maybe it's because there are a lot of Renaissance cat and whole family pictures. If we follow Charles Dempsey's suggestion in the invention of the Renaissance Puto, and regard Veracchio's winged child as a water sprite, or spiritello, embodying the life-giving with two of the medium that once flowed out through his dolphin companion, then perhaps Leonardo was envisioning a similar pairing in the first place. Obviously, it can does not lend itself to the same sort of ready association with a familiar iconography, uh, but as an embodiment of spring, the <coughs> temperament, the child subduing the choleric cat could read as achieving some sort of tempering between propitious life stages or seasonal dispositions in which the active spirits prevail. This is very speculative. <coughs> His translation into a Christ child, um, oops. in the ensuing phase of Leonardo's elaboration of the design is more problematic, but I think that Leonardo uh, maturing in Medici and Florence at the height of its splendor would have been willing to experiment with a more playfully ambiguous Christ image. The two-sided sheet in London shows a design for an archtop painting of a domestic interior of the verso, uh, as you can see, the <coughs> window, recalling the Benoit Madonna. Uh, the mother-child cat group is bound into a lively sculptural unit dominated by the serpentine elements of clutching child and squirming cat. In this pair of drawings, the active seeking after superimposed solutions involving spatial readjustments of heads and limbs shows Leonardo trying out a full-fledged Machia drawing of the type you will write about in the line. The picture itself, I'm not saying that he's extracting it from a dirty wall, but he's drawing the way um, he said he was drawing for that. The picture itself, which seems to have been designed with no commission in mind, was never executed as conceived uh, except in a version by a Milanese follower, and I'm really sorry about the really tremendously lousy scan, but this is it. it, it it's much better illustrated in, in the catalog, actually. Who, who covered over the cat with a lamb, awkwardly seated upright, uh, but the x rays do really indicate that there's a really pathetic, squeezed up cat in there. Um, a Leonardo drawing of a more domesticated variant of the composition. Uh, with a pretty young mother providing a stable platform for the restless serpentine Christ child and his much subdued feline. He is there, but has given up <laughs> struggling. <laughs> these are really quite wonderful. A lot of people just, you know, these are the ones people should talk about. You know, forget about the Mona Lisa. Uh, <laughs> um, did have an afterlife in Milan, as noted in the exhibition's excellent catalog essays. Uh, this serpentine Christ child appears more than once in the Milanese Leonardo circle without the cat. Leonardo's original entwining of human and domesticated beast uh, bears fruit in an emblematic portrait, the magical Cecilia Valerani. 
where the ermine is enlarged and subtly renatured as a composite being with elements incorporated from Leonardo's drawings of other wild creatures, other scarier wild creatures, such as bears. Um, and if you see the morphology of the head, it sort of gives it away that there's something happening to the ermine's head here. It also looks a little bit like a dragon. Um, well, let's see, yes. Uh, oh, oh, here, such as Leonardo studied uh, while he uh, was in the Elephant's country. <coughs> Leonardo's success in assimilating the young woman with her attribute tempts me to suggest an emblematic motive for the Madonna with the cat designs. It seems possible that his own name might have, might have induced Leonardo to study cats or picture a small domesticated lion as the appropriate companion for the Christ child. There were also intrinsic reasons for Leonardo's attachment, such as the enviable visual acuity of the species, often remarked upon in the notebooks, and seemingly of greater importance, their flexibility. Um, and um, cat drawings of superb quality span the length of Leonardo's career, from the exquisitely self-assured fresh pairing of two self-proving cats, or one drawn twice, and a tender little dog on the left, and this is very early, uh, and, and it's beautiful. Uh, from the beginning of his career to the marvelous sheet of house cats, lioness, I think, and dragon from his later years. Uh, the dragon sheet has an inscription, which I've rendered up here, on bending and extension. This animal species of which the lion is the prince, and he really always does classify cats with the lions. Whenever he talks about, you know, doing the comparative anatomy of mammals, the lion and his kind, and he goes through the list and ends with house cats, um, of which the lion is the prince because the joints of its spinal cord are bendable. Um, and so this rather wonderful um, sheet uh, in which you, this is late in the career, uh, in which you actually have a whole, a whole series of observations of a perfectly normal, ordinary house cat napping and sitting watching and so on. And then it sort of begins to split into fighting cats. And then there's the one crouching cat that is repeated over and over again uh, from slightly different positions, but then one particular one is repeated and um, it's along that particular spine that suddenly the bendable spine metamorphoses the cat into a dragon. Um, and of course, that's the other thing that appears in the notebooks repeatedly are references to the dragon being a serpent, effectively. Um, in connection with this material, I uh, have only some items that I have sort of thrown in uh, and that I thought I'd kind of uh, walk us through if there was still time. Is there still time? Oh, okay. Um, because um, obviously it's not as if Leonardo was just inventing the cat as a kind of motif. Um, you can go all the way back to the yard or the tour and find a rather wonderful demonstration of cat flexibility uh, as it almost like a, it's a, an ornamental, but it's also, I don't know, curiously <coughs> observed uh, a detail uh, in the notebooks where there's a perfectly ordinary reposed cat as well in the VR going for a sketchbook. Um, so there is some tradition for obviously cats being figuring in the, in the imaginary uh, of, uh, of the artists. Um, but the, the, the actual treatment of the cat as a kind of demonstration of um, organic flexibility it does seem to be something that keeps Leonardo returning to the creature um, from the very first drawing, in fact, that I showed you. Um, and uh, the, the, the sort of companion sheet uh, to the sheet on the left, even though it's a different color in my, in my download, um, essentially uh, it has no cats except for this figure that is imported from this sequence. And it starts a whole new sequence of transformation that becomes involving horses that behave like cats uh, split up, start fighting, until eventually they turn into St. George of the Dragon, and the dragon gets in again. Uh, so somehow they, they form a cluster of ideas, these creatures. Um, and uh, in Leonardo's case, um, again, uh, serpentine postures comprise, this is the inscription on this one, comprise the principal action 
in the movements of animals. And this action is double. The first is along the length, and the second across the thread. And as you will all be obviously all know, um, on the one hand, uh, there's something systematic going on in these great works of Leonardo, even where he's performing what are, in fact, imaginative transformations. Um, and these correlate with these marvelous late anatomies, um, the anatomies of the centenarian, uh, where you actually have these fabulous uh, drawings in which you, all, you have a kind of spatial scan, but you also have zooms of the different details of the, of the actual um, dissection, um, which give you, you know, kind of variant readings, as it were, uh, on what you're looking at. Uh, but the other thing, of course, is that uh, Leonardo also, uh, that, uh, oh, back, back to that phrase, uh, the movements of animals, uh, which uh, the serpent key movement, uh, which is double, the first is along the length and the second across the thread, which is essentially the engine that leads Leonardo to invent this, what he calls the corponato della prospettiva di Leonardo Vinci, a body born of perspective by Leonardo, of, or of Leonardo da Vinci, discepolo della esperienza, and si ha fatto questo corpo senza esempio dal un corpo ma solamente con semplice linea, it's a constructed artificial body that moves like the perfect serpent, uh, but is related to all of these serpentine, you know, serpentine movements, uh, which of course are also to be found in, in, in these other wonderful drawings of uh, dragons and horsemen in front of one another. So um, there's a kind of thread of thought that obviously Leonardo pursues throughout his life uh, that centers on the figure of the feline. Uh, at the same time, uh, as you all probably know already, the figure of the feline also is at the heart of these. Uh, this is, once again, we're looking at the, um, the, the sort of or compositional drawing for the Burlington House cartoon. Uh, but here are the little sketches that are underneath it. And here you have what is essentially a kind of reprise that with a, an adult and, and a baby, or two adults and a baby, of this particular design, which has somehow stayed in the, you know, the bloodstream of Leonardo's imagination uh, well into his, into his mature years um, after his millennials period, of course. Uh, and I guess I'll just leave you with this. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> well, th thank you very much for that lovely contribution to Leonardo's imagination. I'm sure there are some questions on whether he spent 15 minutes to this person. This question is open. I, I really am not an expert, so. <laughs> Yes? Um, that's a very new discussion about whether Leonardo might be a synesthete. That is, that he hears words as sounds. Because there's a lot of people who quote that and hear the bells as conversation. Oh, yeah. And you know, that, that particular statement, actually, Leonardo, obviously, when he was um, you know, growing up in Florence, um, was very much in, in the know about Medicean culture. Um, Lorenzo de Magnificent, I think in his commento to his own poems, mentioned this kind of power of imagination that can project itself onto things like the sound of bells and hear. And of course, for a poet, you know, you're hearing all all words, all you know, all phrases and so on. Um, so I, Martin Kemp has written about this, of course, and um, I I think there there definitely is a tradition of this kind of projective. Um, reading or projective scene, uh, which comes along with Leonardo. Um, I don't think anybody had thought to link it to the act of drawing in quite such a wonderful way. And I think he does. Um, I mean, I agree with Tom. Uh, thank you very much for reminding us of the importance of the cat. <laughs> and I know it's a very important aspect because I think that, uh, as you like to point out, um, there doesn't seem to be any foundation for this, this idea that the, the cat has a pneumatic um, function in the, in, in the story. So it's a way of moving the time. Here, here, here. I think it somebody just made it, it up. It just seems to be in the literature at some point, yeah. and, and there will be something sort of exclusive or investigated. <coughs> so we have a 
the explanation is that David Allen Brown has suggested that it's simply a, a, a reason to, to give movement to the, to the child. And an excuse for, for that. But I think you've shown us, I think you've shown us something very important, which is, is as you say, the imagination at, at work and, and the way in which he, he, builds, he builds from that. And that, that shift is a marvelous example of building from, from pure observation um, to, yeah. towards but I, I mean, I, I completely agree, and, and, and it is an extraordinarily strange idea. I don't have a child with a cat, it's just strange. And, and it starts with drawings in which he's doing a child with a cat. He does have all kinds of, he does have really interesting reflections in manuscript A. That the Institute of France manuscript is essentially a little treatise on painting. Has it's got a very interesting alternation of topics, and he has a couple of separate um, paragraphs on the movements of figures, movements according to age, and so on. One, he actually says, you know, when when Puccini are 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 represented, if they're seated, then they should be restless and dynamic. If they're standing, then they're timorous and and you know, and slow moving. Um, and so these are Puccini that are crawling around like cats. They're behaving, I mean, they're on all fours, just like a cat. And when they're on all fours, they have the same flexibility as a cat. Um, another one is a statement actually about the difference between the proportions <coughs> of little, little children or toddlers and adults, and um, uh, how much bigger the toddler's head is relative to the, the length, you know, the breadth of its shoulder. I mean, he, he does the Korean thing, you know, how many heads fit it. And, uh, and what he says is that it takes, um, it takes, uh, it takes, um, how does it go? Okay, the, the vital spirits take longer to develop a proper housing, but the head, or the spirit spirit, I guess it is, has to be already pretty large to begin with. And so there's this kind of interesting, I mean, he, he's sort of thinking about little kids being intrinsically different than adults and how they're, I don't know, there's something going on. I suspect there's a humoral, you know, there's a humoral rationale that I just kind of really done any research on. But, you know. uh, Mary, there's one element that uh, I wanted to suggest to include in your argument and it has to do with the fact that when Leonardo uh, recommends his mobile in Zorn, which is also an interesting combination yeah. of Leonardo and that's true. that it immediately transcends into violence because that's what you see on walls, right? Yeah. On spotted walls and spatters. That's but true. Yeah, there is more. Yes. So what you describe here as harmonious and playful is also continuously bordering to a kind of threat of violence, but because you yeah. never know how to care. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, and um, that's one of the things that, you know, if one were thinking about chiaroscuro, not just in terms <coughs> of optics and the exploration of visual phenomena, but more in terms of the real horror of his appearance of things becoming, of things going away, and, and going away for good, you know, or dissolving, then I think that works very well with the whole, the whole idea of the spotted wall becoming a kind of mirror to your fantasie and then other things. I mean, these things, yes, we're right. I mean, he really did have this astonishing description of a, of a campus. Um, and then immediate, almost immediately following, and we have this, this um, Oh, and by the way, then when you see on it, you can actually do these weird things, terrible battles and so on. We have time for a quick moment question. If I could just uh, take up that last comment and possibly risk exiling myself from company in my respect to the last stories. I know we're all very, uh, well, you know, Freud sort of got it wrong, but it's always interesting that uh, Julia Kristeva's essay on motherhood according to the in which she contrasts the approach to uh, the mother and the child, and then what she calls the fetishistic notion of the way in Leonardo, uh, 
the child seizes things uh, um, as what has been referred to as subdued violence. And, and it's, it's so interesting the way in the exhibition one sees this, this strangling of the, of the cat. It's then, there's another transition which is that the child escaping the mother in right. honor of the arm. <laughs> <laughs> but the yeah. cat has become the child. Yeah. And the relationship is transposed. So this continual. Yeah, and there are some other drawings in which that's exactly how kind of psychologizing now. Yeah. Um, well, no, well, you know, I was thinking about it. I thought, you know, maybe Freud was, in fact, had something on the art of the motherhood thing. I, I suspect he did. That was a really fascinating to understand the set, the notion of, of movement, movement of the group, right? And how it translates from the cat to the horses and the dragon, and how the current in the account yields to the people <coughs> <coughs> like very new or people like cats. Yeah. And uh, also the suggestion that there is violence involved, this tension, perhaps violence is a strong word. But that there is a lot of fighting things. Yeah, the tension between the kid and the cat mm -hmm. and the, group, the mother there even mm -hmm. more so. Now if we substitute the cat for that then the parts fit really well. And I always wonder if uh, so much easier to find the cat. Well, yeah. that's what's been suggested, in fact, that you know, Leonardo probably couldn't, couldn't get a lamp to pose comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> Just got the house cat instead, and uh, have no idea. And he obviously had house cats. I mean, there's no, to me, there's no doubt that he spent a lot of time looking at real cats. And so. Uh, Unlike some people, I actually believe these people look at art, at nature, I mean, whatever. But uh, so, um, so I, I guess that's, that's as plausible, you know, that is a plausible explanation. It, it's a ready-made model that's relatively malleable, although probably not as well-mannered as some others might be. A dog would have been better, much more well-held. It's a very, very interesting <coughs> question, but I find myself strangely undrawn <coughs> Um, and that we seem to be previously going in a much more uh, interesting direction, which was towards the idea of the cat as essentially untamable, <laughs> but the child has to be, to some extent, tamed, and the child is also trying to tame and yeah. untamed. Yeah, and that, that could go with a humoral explanation. You're right, by the way, about um, uh, the, the in, in the way in which the, the juxtaposition works. Well, yeah, if, if there are prints out there, there are later in the 16th century where Quidikia is represented as little boys playing with a cat, and I think the idea is that they're aggressive and unmanageable and not quite civilized. And so, you know, childhood. Takes you back to your idea of young couple of people in the first place. It does. Because one of the things I think we should think is that there's all kinds of joys from life, surely, these are joys from memory. It's a joy to draw whatever he likes. So obviously, he's observed some sort of interaction between children. This is truly about what you were saying about this kind of question. The wriggling, the wriggling drawing, and the wriggling beast, which are which are part of the same. Yeah, Patricia Rubin said that there's a combination on these sheets. That some of it looks like it's actually done from life, but then definitely these contrapposto, triple contrapposto things are not. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, on, on this note, I think I should thank the two speakers this afternoon for impeccable time keeping as well as two stimulating papers. Convey you to come back after tea in half an hour for the last session. Thank you very much.